Welcome to Ranger Stories. My name is Tennyson E. Stead. I'm the creator of Jump Rangers. And this is the show where I read things that I'm writing in the Jump Rangers universe and probably edit and discuss them for your viewing pleasure. Today, we're reading Jump Rangers, a game called Conquest, Chapter 18. If you'd like to catch up on previous episodes of Ranger Stories, you can find those episodes on our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash at Jump Rangers. Let's begin. Buzzing over the dusty white landscape of a world covered in spore hives, through milky white gas that gave planet through the through the same. We're gonna say this is where we this is what we do. This is how we do it. We fix cadences. Through the same milky white gas that gave planet mist its ominous name. The Sarge and I were flying spore locusts that we'd trapped a week ago, and that we'd spent the last few days learning how to ride. Maybe this is something the nomads do all the time, and maybe it's something Scrap is really really good at. Good for them. This was my first time riding a spore locust, and I was doing it to sneak past the wasps and the hives on the front lines of the spore's terraforming efforts as they advanced across the surface of mist in search of an even older hive with an even older queen. Nah. Have a wonderful time. Ippy Looney and producer Lucinda Bruce are going to a networking event, and we wish them well. <laughs> Perfect. They're off to make the magic happen. That's how we like it. This was my first time riding a spore locust, and I was doing it to sneak past the wasps and the hives on the front lines of the spore's terraforming efforts as they advanced across the surface of mist. Something had to go wrong. Just as if they could smell my pessimism, a spore wasp veered up from the hive it was climbing out of to smell us out. Veered up from its hive to smell us out. We're just going to make that a little sharper and simpler. Spore wasps are bugs the size of space fighters with four wings, big pincers, and a stinger the size of a battering ram that droops below it as though it were too heavy to just carry the thing. We, on the other hand, were shrunk down to mouse size in order to ride the spore locusts. Ride our spore locusts. Luna, calm down. It's okay. To us, right then, the wind from the wings of that spore locust felt like a hurricane. Our spore locusts were tossed of that spore wasp. The wing, the oh. see, I'm getting myself confused. To us, right then, the wind from the wings of that spore wasp felt like a hurricane. Our spore locusts were tossed and turned on the churning air, and we clung to our, we clung to their backs as they tumbled away from the buzzing wings of the wasp of the larger wasp. Both the Sarge and I, and Scrap for that matter, were covered in stinky Katha bug slime. Stinky Katha slime. To prevent exactly this sort of thing from happening, our locusts shouldn't be able to smell the technology we were carrying, so they shouldn't be releasing pheromones to attract the wasps. It seems like I've confused locusts and wasps a lot when I was, ri when I was writing this. When a second wasp, I did it again started buzzing our way from the creeping, crawling maw of the hive's entrance. I knew that I knew something was off. Whatever that thing was, it was going to get us killed. I knew something was off. Something was going to get us killed. Something was wrong. And it was going to get us killed. Something was very wrong. And it was going to get us killed. Sarge, I think we're in trouble. You break left and I break right. And we'll see which one of these bugs, which one of us these bugs are smelling. Leaning into our locust, the Sarge and I pull apart from one another. Wobbling through the air for a moment while they made up their minds, the wasps swerved through the air to track me. In my calm, I can hear the Sarge's voice. Go low, wrench. I have an idea. Going low means getting closer to the hives below us, where even more of these wasps can smell the pheromones my locust is putting out. Still, you don't argue with your buddies in the middle of a fight. Any plan is better than no plan at all, so I dove towards the ground. Hungry and mad, the wasps dove after me. By now, they'd clearly zeroed, in, zeroed on my locust as the thing they were looking for. Excuse me. Together, my locust and I bombed our way towards the ground. 
Catching the air at the very last moment, my spore locust shoots forward through the haze, skimming the top of the forest and zooming past the looming cliff of the spore hive beside us. Loud as an air raid, the wasps follow us in. One of them bottoms out, snapping tree trunks like twigs as it smashes into the forest below. The other one stays hot on my six, powering towards us through the swirling air. Hot on my tail. Because I don't think they have clocks. At least not analog clocks. Following the wasp down towards the ground on his own locust, the Sarge jumps off his ride, falling through the air like a skydiver. He readies his grappler gun. Thump! Firing his grappler, the Sarge clamps onto the spiky exoskeleton of the wasp on my tail. Swinging around the flying bug, the Sarge tangles up the wasp's flight for a moment. Tumbling through the air, the Sarge and the wasp thrash around in confusion and chaos until the Sarge manages to reel himself in on his winch and swing around to the back of the flying beast, nestled between the wasp's wings, where the pincer and the stinger can't reach him. The Sarge shuts, shuts down, shut down his wrench rig. Lou, it's okay. She's such a good girl. She knows that mom's gone. She wants to know where mama is. It's okay, baby. It's okay. I'm here. Everything's fine. She's a very good girl. Do you want to come be on stream? You want to come? She does not want to come on stream. All right. <clears throat> the Sarge shut down his wrench rig. Suddenly, the Sarge was the size of a normal eight-year-old kid. With all that extra weight as leverage, the Sarge could wrestle the spore wasp just like Scrap had taught him to wrestle the locusts. To wrangle the locusts. Grabbing hold of the massive beast by the neck, the Sarge steered it below my locust. Jump! I jumped. Firing my grappler, small as it was, I caught hold of the spore wasp and winched myself towards the Sarge. Once I jumped onto its back and worked my way into a crease in his, in his jumpsuit, <coughs> I caught firing my grappler, small as I was, Once I'd climbed onto the Sarge's back and worked my tiny way into a crease in his jumpsuit, the Sarge let the spore wasp eat my locust. Finding no other prey in the area, find, finding no other prey, the wasp submitted to the Sarge's control, and now we had a new ride. With Scrap flying on our wing, still on his locust, we buzzed our way over the dusty wasteland of ruined hives that stretches inland from the front lines of the spore infection. Under all that papery biomatter protected by the spore, what's left of the plants and animals that lived here before the Saurian horde came and wrecked everything, that lived here even before the civilization of the mislings themselves. And we gotta change the punctuation a little bit. All those living things are slowly figuring out how to retake their world. Turns out nobody wants to give you trouble when you're riding a spore wasp. Following Scrap's lead, the Sarge flew us off into the murky light. When our spore wasp finally led us off by the gaping hole of the hive where Scrap was told to bring us, our spore wasp was utterly exhausted. Off it flew, presumably to find some water and food. Unlike the other hives we'd seen up close, this one wasn't swarming with wasps and locusts. Slow, undulating spore bugs were still slogging their way up through the papery side of the, up the rough papery side of the hive. I'm assuming because they needed to feed the queen. But there wasn't much to protect or fight for when you get this deep into the infection. Instead of trying to chew up cities and fight off what's left of the Saurian horde, the queen is building new spores with fresh, dormant larvae locked inside. When she's finally ready, stuffed with whatever volatile stuff the spore bugs can feed her, she'll explode and throw those spores off to other parts of the planet, or even into space. When the spores crash into something, they'll break open. One of those larvae will mature into a queen, and a new hive begins. Covered in katha such as we were, we were ignored by the lumbering potato bugs that pushed their way past us into the hive to deliver the food they were carrying in their stomachs to the queen. All we needed to do to find the queen was follow them. For as tough as they were, and paper is one of the strongest human-made building materials, if you didn't know, we didn't want to disturb her. Hmm. 
I think we can make this. All we needed to do to find, was to find the queen was to follow them, but we didn't want to disturb her. Maybe she can feel vibrations from the rest of the hive, and we didn't want to spook her by tripping and falling, or by slipping on Katha as we climbed down one of the vertical tunnels in the paper mache maze in which we found ourselves. To make things easy, we got small and hitched a ride on the back of a spore bug, deeper and deeper into the hive that carried us until it reached the shore of a massive underground lake full of sticky glowing fluid. When it touched the goopy green liquid, it spit up the food in its belly and turned around to find more. Luna, calm down, baby. It's okay. She's really upset. Well, we're going to finish this up. We've got just a couple more pages, and then I will take care of the girl. Luna, it's okay. It's okay. Slipping down the side of the spore bug, I peered into the steamy greenish glow of the cavern. There at the very center of the lake was a massive island of flesh and carapace that was bathing in the bug spew. Shimmying the, the plates of her exoskeleton, she seemed to sense our presence. Never in my life have I felt so small. Actually, that was because I was actually very small compared to my normal size. Nudging the Sarge, I switched off my wrench rig and became kid-sized again. Even still, that queen was huge. Much as I felt more myself at this scale, being bigger didn't help my sense of powerlessness. So what do we do? Do we swim out there? No, said Scrap. Beneath that sea of slurp, the eggs and spores the queen is spawning are taking form. I believe she will not want them disturbed. So then what? Unraveling her six powerful towering legs from beneath her body, the queen raises herself above the sea of puke she bays in to get a better look at us. With just a few deep and lumbering steps, she closed the distance between the center of the lake and the slippery, nasty shore where we were standing. When she lowered herself to look at us, I couldn't avoid making the observation that her eyes were milky and whited out in much the same way as the, so as the skies of mist itself. If I had to guess, I'd say the queen has never even left this chamber. If you ask me, she's never even seen the light of day. Looking into those swirling, milky eyes, I could almost see home, earth. In those eyes, I could see the undersea observation room where I took my oath as a jump ranger. All around me, the hull of the bunker creaked with the shifting waters. Out on the floor of the harbor, the hulls of ancient wrecks continued to crumble and rust. What did I imagine was going to change if the spore came to earth? What was I hoping for? Exactly. When I was little, picture files were passed around from back before the invasion. When humans took pictures of Earth from the moon, for example, the whole planet was green and blue. Our world looked alive in a way you just don't see too often in the Saurian Horde. Is that what I want for Earth? What happens when people come back to Earth and they try to take that life and use it? What happens if the Saurians are driven what happens when people come back to Earth? Uh, <laughs> Luna, take a deep breath. Calm down. Tell you what, I'm going to pick up the girl. I'm going to bring her over here because I am losing my focus. So give me one sec. I'm going to be right back. We're going to delete some sentences here. So, <clears throat> our world looked alive in a way you just don't see too often in the Saurian Horde. Is that what I want for Earth? Once the spore inhabit a world, they're never really gone. Dormant spores will inevitably be buried in remote parts of the world or deep underground. 
So long as there's nothing to eat, so long as things are quiet, they will remain at rest. If things get noisy, if the smell is wrong, how do I know all this? Is the spore queen inside my head? Am I having yet another telepathic psychor conversation with yet another highly evolved consciousness from beyond the stars? Is this what my life is now? Would you believe that I could almost hear her laughing at me? How does she know what laughter is? Did she find out about laughing by reading my thoughts? Would the bugs have laughter and nobody knows about this? Yeah, she's definitely laughing at me. Look, lady, respectfully, I can't promise that people won't do something stupid 10,000 years in the future. Doing stupid things is kind of our area of expertise, if you want to know the truth. Doing stupid things is what brought the Sarge and I here to start with. What I can tell you for sure is that planet Earth is not the planet people tell me it used to be. Our colonies have seed banks and gene banks and all kinds of information about the things that used to live there. If any of those things are living there now, I've never seen them. But you know what? But you know that. That's what it is. I've never seen them, but you know that. You know how this works. You'll just get that information from the fossils in the ground. You'll dig and you'll learn. What you want to know is if people will get in your way and hurt your hives. Maybe. Maybe we will. But not on my watch. Not if I can convince them that Earth can be saved. If we can just leave it alone. Maybe they'll listen. Either way, I know the Saurians will fight for what they want. They always do. Yes, they always do. Wow. It kind of feels like we've connected on something. It kind of feels like we understand each other. If we are careful, if we give them a chance to thrive, then we can take the spores. Just then, it occurred to me that this queen is going to remember this conversation for the rest of her days. All the queens that are born from this queen will remember this conversation for the rest of their days. If the spore arrive on Earth, and if they help Earth survive the Saurian invasion, they won't be helping humanity. Not really. No, they'll be helping me. Taking a deep breath, I ask myself whether I can accept that kind of responsibility. And that's where we end this chapter. I, I like the spore stuff. I like the spore stuff in this in this book. Um, we're we're doing good. I think it's an engaging, fun, interesting read. There's a lot to like about it. There's, you know, the truth is, I, I I know that there's going to be a lot of editing and a lot of revision to do, and <sighs> this is just the beginning of the process. But I'm pleased, and I think we're going to have something really special lined up for the um, crowdfunding release in in 2024. So that's it. Uh, I, I'm not going to be doing my usual. Um, Mission Files stream on Thursday because I have a networking event that I'm going to. There's a premiere. Um, and some people that I'd like to meet there, get to know better. Uh, I don't know whether or not we're going to have Metagame on Saturday. We had one last Saturday with Lucinda Bruce as our guest star. Uh, check it out on YouTube if you haven't seen it. And we'll have either a Metagame on Saturday or I'll be back this time next week for more Ranger stories. I'm going to get this posted, and then I'm going to be putting um, the next chapter of, of a game called Conquest on the page and getting it posted probably later tonight. So, thank you for watching. Uh, drop me a line. Always join the Discord if you have questions. I'm always happy to answer them. And don't be a stranger, Ranger. <laughs>